Hello, and welcome to worship here at Lancaster Church of the Brethren. I'm Misty Winch. I'm one of the pastors here at Lancaster Church. We're glad that you're here to worship with us. Our sincere hope is that we will all give our hearts and our spirits to this hour to worship. We have heard some wonderful feedback about how our services here online touch not only our own church members' hearts, but others who are choosing to worship with us. We want to encourage anyone who is watching to participate as fully as possible in the life of the church. If you want to receive our weekly Friday bulletin via email, or if you're seeking pastoral care or have words of appreciation, please feel free to contact us. The information about how to do that is on your screen now, and it'll be on there for a little longer at the end of the service. We'd be glad to have you connecting with us in whatever way is possible from wherever you are watching. Friends, we want to thank you for the extra blessings you shared with the church over the past several weeks. It shouldn't be surprising, but it still kind of is that in spite of rolling into December, being pretty far behind our expenditures, we ended the year just a little bit in the black. Isn't that exciting? Your generosity is such a blessing. Please continue to offer your time, talent, and treasure as we move through 2021. Our ministries continue with your outrageous participation and your encouragement. Pastor Don Fitzke's sermon title today is This I Believe, God Created the World for a Purpose. He'll tell you more about our new sermon series with his message. Our scripture today will be read by Mark Myers, our new media manager. We thought it'd be nice if you could put a face with a name, and we are certainly feeling blessed to have him with us to help us with his expertise for putting these services together. As always, we are grateful for the work that so many people put in to make these worship services possible. Many of them are volunteers, and all of us are still learning new things all the time to continue to try to provide as close to excellence in worship as we can get, even while we can't be together. If one song or another isn't in your usual style of worship, I would encourage you to listen to it from the perspective of one who wants to encourage the ones who put it together for us. God is glorified in all of us. Our call to worship comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11. You are worthy, our Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. Praise the Lord, sing hallelujah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise the Lord, our great creator. All his angels praise Sky. 
All you fruitful trees and cedars, every hill and mountain high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all you people, rulers, traitors, judges all, praise his name, young men. everyone. Good morning. This morning, Pastor Don is going to be talking about God's creation. Now, God has created some amazing things. God created plants and trees. God created the animals. And God created us, people. This morning, Ella and I are going to teach you a song about some of the things in God's creation. This is actually a song that I wrote for the children's music class. I think it was sometime last year. And so we're going to use the same cards that I use for the children in music class so that you can see the pictures that go along with the song. Now, this isn't just the children's time, church. This is the whole church time. So everyone's going to learn the song. We're going to sing it through once to start. And then we're going to sing it through a second time, and I want everybody to join in. Even if you mess up some of the words, that's not a problem. But I want to hear all of you singing this morning. Okay? Here we go. A blast of singing. Blast of singing. Thank you, God, for dogs and cats. Thank you, God, for crickets and bats. Thank you, God, for my head that wears hats. Thank you, God, for all of that. Thank you, God, for plants and trees. Thank you, God, for birds and bees. Thank you, God, for my toes and knees. Thank you, God, for all of Thank you, God, for seeds we sow. Thank you, God, for flowers in rows. Thank you, God, for my eyes and nose. Thank you, God, for all of those. Thank you, God, for Saturn's rings. Thank you, God, for bells that ring. Thank you, God, that I can sing. Thank you, God, for Everybody at home, now it's your turn. Thank you, God, for dogs and cats, crickets and bats, head that wears hats. Here we go. Thank you, God, for dogs and cats. Thank you, God, for crickets and bats. Thank you, God, for my head that wears hats. Thank you, God, for all of that. Thank you, God, for plants and trees. Thank you, God, for birds and bees. Thank you, God, for my toes and knees. Thank you, God, for all of these. Thank you, God, for seeds we sow. Thank you, God, for flowers in rows. Thank you, God, for my eyes and nose. Thank you, God, for all of Thank you, God, for everything. 
I hope that you had the chance to sing along. Now, here's one of the great things about having a recorded worship service. If you didn't get it that second time, just keep rewinding the service back until you get it. In fact, you can watch the entire church service and just keep coming back to this song all week to remind you about God's beautiful creation. Ella, thank you for your help today. You're welcome. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we came into 2021 last week encouraged by visions of a new and better year. And yet last week we watched our nation's capital stormed by vigilante protesters. We witnessed violence, disrespect, and general chaos. We were and are disturbed by it all, Lord. First, we thank you that we live in a nation where peaceful protest is still allowed and even encouraged, where we can speak our minds and lead our lives as Christians without fear. We know personally some people who cannot live without that fear because they belong to you. And yet we have seen what happens when we take our freedoms too far. All we can do and all we really need and want, Lord, is for you to inspire us as Christians to live into your will, into your heart, into your power, and even with that power to live into peace for our lives. Take this love of the political fray out of our hearts and replace it with grace and love and kindness and tolerance for the opinions of others. Help us to seek the scriptures for our opinions, not the newspapers, magazines, or the talking heads on the TV. Give us good sense, your sense, and your wisdom. Make us instruments of your peace. 
make this path as clearly right to us as we think the political agenda of our favorite party is. On second thought, Lord, make your path more obvious to us as the right one than that. Lord, we pray today for lost lives, for those closest to us who have lost loved ones, and those hundreds of thousands who suffered through this virus and lost their lives. We are grateful that some of our loved ones here at Lancaster Church have come through it and have regained or are regaining health. But even as we praise you for that, we know that there are those who aren't experiencing that same situation. Help us to have a heart for them too. We pray today, Lord, for those of our number who await upcoming medical procedures, that you might give them a sense of peace about it. And we ask your hand of healing for those who are recovering. We pray for those who await test results, too. And Lord, we pray for those in cancer treatments and rehab centers, whether they're members of our body or our beloved relatives and friends. We pray for those under hospice care, especially today for Karen's brother at home. Bless them and those who love them and their caregivers with a sure sense of your presence with them. Lord, once again today, we pray for our elders who are lonely, especially one of our sisters in a new space and now under quarantine. Newness is difficult enough to deal with at the best times for some of our elders, but the loneliness that comes with quarantine makes that even worse. We ask your hand and presence for her and others who can't receive regular visitors. Father, as always, we ask you, for an end to this pandemic sooner than we think is possible, even with a vaccine that is being distributed as we speak. Give us patience to await your timing for each of us while we look for the good you will bring out of even this terrible circumstance. Today we pray for the ministries of Long Run Church in Lee Heighton. Bless all who serve and those they minister to with your love and care. Inspire them even as we ask you to inspire us with how to care for our neighbors and friends at a time like this. And now, Lord, as we come to you with a time of listening to a special arrangement of a song many of us know so well, we do thank you, Lord, for a foretaste of your glory divine that is our life here because we have the blessed assurance of knowing that Jesus is ours. We pray in his name. Amen. In the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was still no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all of the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything he had made, 
and indeed, it was very good. It was a rough week to prepare a sermon. For whatever reason, I was having trouble focusing to begin with and wasn't as far along as I should have been by Wednesday noon. And then the news started coming out of Washington, D.C., and I was pretty much done for the day as far as sermon preparation went. I suppose, like some of you, I was glued to the news for the next several hours, looking with dismay upon what was happening in our nation's capital. And I've been reading and watching the news pretty closely ever since. I considered scrapping my planned topic and more directly addressing national events, but I decided not to do that. But I would like to interrupt our regularly scheduled programming with just a few thoughts on things that I find especially troubling troubling about this week's events, and maybe just a brief reminder of who we are as God's people. First, I'm troubled by pictures showing Jesus flags being waved alongside Confederate flags. The Confederate flag is a symbol of hatred that is utterly incompatible with the love of Jesus Christ. 
the white supremacy symbolized by the Confederate flag is anti-American and anti-Christian. Christians should not be associated with Confederate flags. I'm troubled by Christians who claim to stand for truth, who instead are embracing the repeated blatant lies of an immoral demagogue. Lies that have been proven false by multiple recounts, by the testimony of election officials of both parties who have rebutted every falsehood, and by courts of law, many of them headed by judges appointed by Republicans, who have found dozens of legal challenges to be lacking in evidence or merit. Christians need to tell the truth and cannot embrace and perpetuate falsehoods. I'm troubled by people, regular people and politicians who claim fidelity to law and order and yet refuse to accept the results of a lawful election and then cause, contribute to, or condone violent disorder when it suits their goals. We are people of God's peace. We do support peaceful protests that champion just causes, but we reject violence no matter what the cause. The prophet Hosea spoke of people who sow the wind and reap a whirlwind. I think he was saying, what he was saying is that actions often have unintended consequences. Another way of saying it might be that those who play with fire eventually get burned. This week, our nation got burned. We reaped the whirlwind. And I fear that if we don't witness to a better way, greater storms lie ahead. Be not deceived. We are followers of Jesus who stand on the side of love, truth, and peace. Those qualities seemed like they were in short supply in our nation's capital this week. We now continue with our regular programming. So today we're beginning a, a new sermon series called This I Believe. And if that sounds familiar to you, it's because we're, we've are we repurposed the title of a series of essays, which most recently was a national public radio feature. And we're using it as kind of a catch-all to allow Pastor Misty and me to preach on topics of interest to us over the next several weeks. We hope that at least some of these topics also may be of interest to you. Upcoming topics include the Bible is true, simplicity is a Christian virtue, prayer is powerful, the church is still the best hope for the world, and life is better with Jesus. Today, my topic is God created the world for a purpose. So there are two parts to that statement. First, that God created the world, and second, that God had a purpose in doing so. So those are the two areas that we'll reflect on. Along the way, we'll dip into Genesis 1 and 2 and also look at the relationship between faith and science. The scripture that was read for us included selected verses from Genesis 1 and 2, which is where we read about how God created the world. And scholars point out that Genesis actually has two creation accounts. The first is the familiar day-by-day version with each day beginning and God said and each day ending with and there was evening and there was morning on the first day or the second day and so forth. On the sixth day, God created humankind in his own image, male and female. He created them. He blessed them and charged them to be fruitful and multiply and exercise dominion over the created world. Now, in that first account, there's no mention of a a single man and woman, but of humankind, which is what the Hebrew word Adam means. At the end of that sixth day, God surveyed all of his creation and pronounced that it was very good. And then we know he rested on the seventh day. Genesis 2, beginning at verse 4, tells the story in a different way. Some view it as a retelling of the whole creation account, while others see it as a more detailed explanation of day six. And there are some differences between the two. While in Genesis 1, God speaks the world into existence, in the second version, God acts. 
We read that God first shaped Adam from the dust of the ground, breathed life into him and placed him in a garden named Eden. And then sometime later, God decided that Adam needed a human companion and created the one Adam would name Eve using a rib from Adam's side. And there are some other differences in the two accounts. For example, the first uses the word dominion to describe humanity's relationship to the rest of creation, while the second speaks of taking care of the garden. Now, my question is, how are we to understand these accounts of creation in the Bible? Some want to read them as historic accounts of how God created the world in this precise order in six literal days. So-called young earth creationists who take this view then conclude that the world is no older than 10,000 years old, and they thus reject all of the science and the theory of evolution that points to a world that is not thousands, but billions of years old. Young earth creationists often advocated what is called the calendar day view that says day in Genesis 1 literally means a 24-hour day. Now, others have suggested that the word translated into English as day can be understood also as age, which opens the possibility that God's creative process took much longer than seven literal days and makes it easier to synchronize the insights of science and scripture. Still, others take a literary view of the first chapters of Genesis, and the idea here is that these accounts shouldn't be read like a science or history book, but more like poetry. Poetry also conveys truth, but in a different way. A young earth view that believes the world was created in six literal days less than 10,000 years ago immediately sets up a contest between faith and science. But such conflict isn't inevitable. Francis Collins is a Christian who led the Human Genome Project and now directs the National Institutes of Health He found bio, he founded BioLogos, uh, which is an organization of Christians who are scientists whose mission statement says BioLogos invites the church and the world to see the harmony between science and biblical faith. The name combines bio as in biology, which means life with logos, which means word, a term that John's gospel applies to Jesus. And their website includes a a series of clear and accessible common questions essays that shed light on various topics related to the intersection of faith and science. And if you're interested in such topics, I would encourage you to go to biologos.org and read some of the articles there. Biologos advocates evolutionary creation, which they describe as a Christian position on origins that takes the Bible seriously as the inspired and authoritative word of God, and takes science seriously as a way of understanding the world God has made. And they embrace two main ideas that I also embrace, that God created all things, including human beings in his own image, and that evolution is the best scientific explanation we currently have to explain the diversity and similarities of all of life on earth. In in its Common Questions essay, Are Science and Christianity at War?, Biologos.com suggests God reveals himself in the book of scripture and the book of nature. To learn more about God and his work, we study both books. When one book is confusing or ambiguous, insights from the other book can help us understand it. In both revelations, we look for the underlying truth of who God is and how he made the world. And so we read in 2 Timothy 3 that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching. Clearly, we learn about God and God's ways through the specific revelation of scripture. But we also learn about God through the general or natural revelation of creation. As Psalm 19, 1 and 2 puts it, The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. And Romans 1, 19 to 20 says, For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So we learn some things about God through the book of Scripture, 
which is the domain of faith. And we also learn about God through the book of nature, which is where science comes in. Understood rightly, the two do not need to be in conflict. I think of it this way. Journalists and others talk about the five W's, who, what, when, where, and why, and then they throw in how as well. And a complete news story seeks to answer these five or six questions. Well, I would suggest that faith and science together give us a fuller picture of God's story by answering different questions. Science may be better equipped to explain what, when, and how, but we need faith to explain who and why. And to tell the truth, I'm not sure where, where fits in. But we don't need to reject the findings of science in order to embrace faith, and neither do we need to reject faith to embrace the insights of science. Conflict between faith and science arises when we mismatch the book with the questions that we seek to answer. When science tries to say that the natural world is the only world that exists, then science has wandered into topics for which it is neither equipped nor qualified to speak. By the same token, when faith ignores the physical evidence that God has provided to help us understand God's works and ways, then it also has strayed into alien territory. Biologos puts it this way, science is both powerful and limited. Science has vast explanatory value when it comes to describing natural history and natural phenomena Yet it isn't the right tool to answer some of the really big questions, like why there is something rather than nothing, and whether there is a creator God who loves us. So when we read Genesis 1 and 2, we might gain more by focusing on who and why, and not so much on what, when, and how. Taking this approach, some of the lessons I learned from the biblical creation story are these. First, We live in a world that was created on purpose. It is not random, not accidental. It didn't just happen through a spontaneous Big Bang. God had and has a plan for his creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And second, humans are the crowning achievement of God's creation. On the first five days of creation, God declared that the day's work was good. Only on the sixth day when God made people did he declare that it was very good. Only people bear the image of God, which which doesn't mean that we are God or are on the same level as God. Adam and Eve made that mistake. But it means that we imperfectly resemble our creator in ways that other creatures do not. And we have a special role in God's creation. The writer of Psalm 8 verses 3 to 6 marveled, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, and the stars that you established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you've made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You've given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. We learn from Genesis 1 and 2 and other scriptures that God intentionally created the world and gave us a position of privilege and responsibility in that world. But that still doesn't answer the question of why God decided to create in the first place, why there is something rather than nothing, as we quoted earlier from Biologos. I guess there would be some different possibilities. Is it A, God was bored and needed something to do to pass the time. You know, he maybe he had been cooped up too long during a pandemic and ran out of jigsaw puzzles. Maybe that's it, but I don't think so. Is it B, God was lonely and in need of companionship? I don't think so. God embodies community within his triune nature. I don't think God gets lonely. Or was it C, God is an egomaniac who needs people to bolster a fragile self-image by heaping praise and adulation upon him. I think this accusation has been leveled against God, and Scripture does say that God desires our praise and acts to display his glory. But I don't think C is quite right either. 
in an online article on the Evangelical Seminary website, writer Kyle Keltz addresses this question, why did God create anything? And Keltz turned to the writings of theologian and philosopher Thomas Aquinas to arrive at an answer. Now, this gets a little theological, but Aquinas believed that God is infinite, perfect, eternal, all-knowing, and all-powerful. And as the source of the world and everything that exists, God is self-sustaining in that he eternally exists by his own nature. Because God is infinite and perfect, God lacks nothing and needs nothing. So God has no selfish reason to create. Creation can't be about what's in it for God. There was nothing that God needed to get. Rather, the issue was that God had something to give his goodness and love. And love by its nature is something that needs to be shared. And so God created a world and created us as recipients of his love. Again, following Aquinas, Celt suggests that love and goodness are things which tend to spread themselves. People who have experienced love know that it is never something they want to keep to themselves. Those who know and feel love want to spread it as much as they can. Love is not something that ever runs out. And so we conclude that God created the world and us to receive, share, and spread his goodness and love. Celts again, if God wants to create to spread his love, this has several implications for what he will create. For one, he, God will create beings with intellects and wills. If God did not create beings with intellects, there would be no one to know him. If God did not create beings with free will, there would be no one to freely choose and love him. Moreover, if God wants his creatures to love him, he must also create the world in such a way that communicates his divine attributes. And so, out of an abundance of love, God creates to share that love with others. And we respond to God's loving act of creation by glorifying God, not to feed God's ego or because God needs our praise, but because we are grateful for the gift of life and love and want to continue to reflect that love back to God and share it more broadly with others. And in that sense, we were created for the purpose of praising God for his grace and glory. And so in Isaiah 43, 4 to 7, during a time of exile and hardship, God promised his people, because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you, God would bring back everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. In the New Testament, in Ephesians 1, Paul explains that God chose, blessed, and predestined his people for adoption to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed upon us. And the Bible ends in Revelation with words that we use to begin our service. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. This, I believe, God created the world for a purpose. It did not randomly evolve by chance, but was created by a God whose very essence is love. God wanted to share that love, and so he created a world to demonstrate the work of his hands. He created us, endowed us with his image, and charged us to care for his creation. He lavished his love upon us so that we could bring glory to him by returning his love and sharing it with others. In gratitude, we give God the glory and sing his praises. Let the praises ring.
Please pray with me. God, we thank you for revealing yourself to us through the book of nature and the book of scripture. Thank you for a created world that daily demonstrates your majesty, complexity, beauty, and mystery. And thank you for the Bible, which tells us the story of your extravagant love. Help us to testify to your glory as we radiate that love outward to others and upward to you. In the name of Jesus, the greatest demonstration of that love, we pray. Amen.